Hey, what's up, folks? Welcome back to another edition of the Rodcast. It'll be a short and sweet one. We just got an hour, and I know there's the Colin Simmons extravaganza going on right now. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll give you my experience with the uh, the big-time mega recruit on the defensive side of the ball back in my day. We'll get into that. Also, we'll talk about splash plays. We're talking about big-time players like Colin Simmons. Big-time players make big-time plays in big games. We'll talk about those big time plays and how many Texas made last season. We'll also get into uh, some other uh, Texas football discussion. I want to get into like, a macro football discussion and talk about defense. Is everybody's hype talking about Colin Simmons? We're going to keep it up talking about the defensive side of the ball because I'm a little excited about it too. Uh, please hit us up. Any questions on the chat? Uh, shout out uh, to Julio. Shout out to my man CB already on there early. Uh, so let's get it popping. Let's jump right into it. All right. First of all, congratulations. All right. To all Longhorn fans. Who are excited about the Colin Simmons commitment? Some of y'all already do. It seems like y'all are confident, almost overconfident. That's all good, all right, because Texas found a way to close the deal. You're talking about a guy that could end up being a, a trans, you know, kind of transcendent foundational piece for Texas on the defensive side of the ball uh, in years to come, especially when they jump to the SEC. So that's why a lot of Longhorn fans are excited about where Sark is building, especially toward the future. So, so we're on the defensive side of the ball. Let's stay there. Let's talk about defense. Uh, first of all, my experience is this might be one of the biggest uh, defensive end recruits, edge recruits since hell Corey Redding back in my day. I don't Corey Redding, I don't know if you can get bigger than what Corey Redding was. He was the number one recruit in the country. He was the number one defensive recruit in the country at the time. And he played that outside linebacker, defensive end, he ended up being a D tackle in the league. So I mean, my man Corey Redding just kept growing. He came to he came to Texas as a guy that ran down on kickoffs. All right. Some of y'all still remember that dude ran down on kickoffs and then he ended up at that D tackle position in the league. Hey, what's up, Cameron? What's up? What's up, Fred? Shout out. All right. Shout out to Hey Sue. Shout out to all y'all, man. We appreciate y'all coming through. All right. Now, that was a huge recruit. That honestly, Corey Rand is why I ended up committing to Texas. Corey Rand was one of those names from North Shore where, you know, it was, he was such a, a big time name, a big time, you know, from a big time brand like North Shore, which is still a big time brand, that, you know, it was, uh, you know, kind of a, that, that, it was one of those pieces that once Mac Brown got Corey Redding, it seemed like everything else just kind of fell into place for that class because everybody wanted to see what 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 the uh, what all the the what all the hubbub, what all the talk was about. Now you're talking about Mac Brown at that, at that time built the number one recruiting class in '99 in the country, and I wanted to be a part of that. And part of that was Corey Redding. And when I heard Corey Redding was on board, I had to think about, hey man, Rod B needs to be on board too. Uh, and then you got Chris Sims on board, and boom, the final chess piece, and that became the class that Mac Brown kind of built Mac Brown Texas football on his first, you know, official class uh, that he could put his stamp on. And Sark has done that with a ton. <laughs> All right, of recruits already. You talk about a lot of big time five star recruits he's brought in the Kelvin Banks of the world, the Arch Mad uh the Arch Mannings of the world. Uh now you're talking about another one in uh you know in, 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 in what he's doing right now with Colin Simmons. So uh just committed, but obviously we got a long way to go. All right, so and and yeah, and Corey Redding was one of those guys that like I said, he was a he was a linchpin recruit, and I think Colin Simmons can be like a linchpin recruit, just a foundational piece in the class. All right, so let's get talk. Let's talk defense because I'm excited about talking defense. Appreciate you guys joining us. So I started thinking about Colin Simmons and I'm just, you know, visualizing him in the future, making plays at Texas. All right. So I'm thinking about big time players making big time plays in big games and thinking about the players who made the most big time plays. So I, want, I, want, I want to start looking at havoc rate. And for those who don't know what havoc rate on defense is, basically, everybody's got a different definition of it. But usually it's all the splash plays on defense. So you're talking about interceptions, PBUs, forced fumbles, tackles for loss, or sacks. You know, those are considered your splash plays, all right, on defense. And Havoc Rate keeps up with those splash plays. They use some of some include fumble recoveries and some don't because they consider that kind of a lucky, uh, lucky statistic that you're just in the right place at the right time. Uh, and yeah, Shy, that's exactly what we're about to get to. Uh, Havoc plays. This is this is the crazy thing. This is why you got to give PK and get GP Gary Patterson a lot of credit. All the coaches on the defensive side of the ball and the players too, of course, because the turnaround was tremendous from 2021 to 2022. So if you're looking at Havoc plays, all right, Texas in 2021. If you're looking at just uh, Havoc rate and Havoc plays, they didn't have one player in the top 34 players in the conference 
in Havoc plays, in Havoc plays per game, looking at just individual players. That was in 2021. All right, not one in the top 34. And then you fast forward to 2022. Texas had four in the top 33, three players in the Big 12. We're talking about conference play who led the Big 12 in Havoc plays, three in the top 10, three in the top 10. You had four in the top 33, but three in the top 10. You had Jalen Ford led the Big 12. <laughs> no surprise. All right. Y'all knew where it's going there. Jalen Ford led the Big 12 in splash plays for a defensive player. And yes, it is a damn travesty that my man didn't win defensive player of the year. I know he's picked to be the preseason defensive player of the year. And if he gets the award this year and earns it, then great. But everybody knows he earned it last year. Uh, that was a that was a damn shame. That was a travesty. Um, he ended up with based on these numbers, because like I said everybody's definition is different. Uh, with 19 total Havoc plays, that led the Big 12, uh, 1.58 per game. Um, and <laughs> he, he set all types of records. He he was the perennial playmaker on defense in the Big 12. And I'm not telling you guys anything that y'all didn't see with your own eyes. And <laughs> that was confirmed. Uh, Jalen Ford, just to give you his stats really quickly so we can move on. He had 109 tackles. <laughs> Uh, yeah, which is actually, you know, more than the defensive player of the year. He had, um, 57 though solo, four interceptions, three forced fumbles. Uh, he had two fumble recoveries. He became the third Longhorn, uh, defensive player to win big 12 defensive player of the week, three times in a season, joining Derek Johnson and Jackson Jeffcoat. Uh, he also forced a turnover in six straight games. And tally 10 plus tackles uh, for uh for six times, I should say, uh in the season. And he also is the only player in the Big 12 to put up at least a hundred tackles, 10 tackles for loss, four interceptions, three forced fumbles in a single season since 2000. Yeah, back when Rob B was on the 40 acres. Only power five player with four interceptions and three forced fumbles. Only FBS player with four interceptions and three forced fumbles and two fumble, and two fumble recoveries. Only FBS linebacker with four interceptions. And then, of course, he tied Derrick Johnson with the UT linebacker record for interceptions. Speaking of transcendent uh, foundational pieces on the 40 acres on the defensive side of the ball, Derrick Johnson is another one. And I'm not going to take all the credit for Derrick Johnson, but I did, I did host him on his visit. That's all I'll say. I'm just saying Mac Brown said, hey, Rob B, we got to get, we got to get him. Can you get him? Can you close the deal? And I said, for shizzle, for shizzle. I didn't say for shizzle, but I said, yes, very confidently. Yeah, we could do that. And then boom. All right, there you go. Derrick Johnson is one of the greatest defensive players in the history of college football. And he, he did it wearing the burnt orange. And I'm, I, I'm sure he would have went to Texas anyway, but having Rod B host him on his visit. I'm sure that that you know that helped the situation, helped it along just a little bit. All right, but getting back to it. All right, so splash plays. So DeMarvion Overshawn was ninth. So we already oh, talked about Jalen Ford. He led the, the Big 12. And by the way, you had zero. Let me say that again. You had zero players in the top 34 players in 2021, and you had three in the top 10 in 2022. DeMarvion Overshawn was ninth uh, with 15. And 1.25 per game. Jade Barron also right with him uh, with 15. Now, in different ways uh, for DeMarvin Oshon, you got 10 tackles for loss, five PBUs for Jade Barron. He had the 11 tackles for loss, two interceptions, two PBUs. A little bit different. All right. A little bit different for him. Uh, shout out. Hey, look at that. Mission to Houston Lamar. DB high, baby. <laughs> shout out, baby. Love that. Now, getting back to it. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. See, hey, Taff, you got to give it up for Taff, man. He closed the deal on Arch. That's big. All right, but I'm just saying, Mac Brown told me I had to have Derrick Johnson. I got it done. I ain't going to wait. Hey, you said, basically, Mac said, if we get him, we got a chance to win a national title. That's all you had to say. It's all you had to say. All right. So, <laughs> uh, all right. So, let me get back to it, though. So, Marvion Overshaw and Jay Dan, both of those guys ended up with 15. All right, of those splash plays in the top 10. And Deshaun Jameson rounded out. He was at, uh, basically ranked 33rd. He ended up with 11 splash plays. Still pretty damn good. Now, you're losing two of those guys. And if you want to look at Texas overall, they led the Big 12 in Havoc rate this season. 
18.9%. Actually, Oklahoma was right there too. Oklahoma was second. Oklahoma made a lot more. They didn't make any against Texas, <laughs> but uh, they ended up making a lot more than you think. Uh, and yeah, K-State was up there too, which makes sense for K-State end up winning the Big 12. But if you just start looking at this season and projecting forward, you're going to need more of those splash plays. The problem for Texas is they haven't converted those plays into – like they need more takeaways because they only had 14 of those yesterday uh, last year. And remember, even Pete Kwiatkowski said in in one of his well, he doesn't talk to the media much. The only media availability he had this offseason, um, I believe, when he threw out the numbers, he said they had they had 14 takeaways and 21 missed opportunities. Maybe I was, I you know, I, that's what I thought I heard him say, and I wrote it down: 21 missed opportunities. I mean, that's me a dropped interception or a fumble that they didn't get on and didn't recover, you know, a chance for a turnover or a takeaway that they didn't get that, that they should have been able to cash in on. That's a lot. You get half of those. That's a different season altogether. They had 27 sacks, and I hit, the number he mentioned was 13 missed sacks. So you were top 10, second in college football in pressures. What up? A second in, fo- in college football in pressures, but you only converted 27, uh, you know, converted those into 27 sacks. 13 missed opportunities. So that's that to me is something else the defense can, and they, they've they talked about it, that they want to improve on. If they do that, you know, this this defense could potentially go from a, you know, a, a good defense. And it is a, a really good defense now. Uh, at the point they're at 28. And you're a good defense when you can be, you know, top 40, somewhere around there. If you're top 40, you're a good defense. You want to be an elite defense. Then you're talking about getting in the top, you know, top 20. I would say these days, top 20, you may be able to say, oh, man, we are we could be considered an elite defense. We're talking about scoring defense here, too. And the last time Texas was top 20 in scoring defense, you got to go back to 2009, last time. They were 20, they were 28th last year, so they weren't, they weren't bad. They were 99th in 2021, and then they went to 28th. It's one of the most remarkable turnarounds in the history of Texas football. So they, I wonder if they could take that next step. We got a lot of continuity. You got some some big time players back like Jalen Ford. I think Jade Barron's a beast. You guys know my favorite Jade Barron stat. He's got eleven and a half tackles for loss. Last time a Texas defensive back had eleven and a half tackles for loss, nineteen seventy eight. Ricky Churchman, shout out to Ricky Churchman. He don't get Ricky Churchman ain't got many shout outs. I guarantee I'm giving him more than anybody with that stat about Jade Barron because it's crazy. It's been a while. So can this defense take the next step? They're, they're, I think they're going to be a good defense regardless. Can they be an elite defense? And what would it take for them to become an elite defense? We'll, we'll get into that and talk about that a little bit too. But the transformation is worth discussing. Um, someone said, do you have any concern that Simmons could end up being one of those guys? What can Texas do for me instead of what I can do for Texas? No, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know the young man, you know, you know, I, I, the, 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 the good, the good thing, even if he is a player that comes, to Austin and he wants to play at Texas instead of playing for Texas for those who don't get you know the <laughs> the uh the statement or the analogy I always say it's like the JFK quote right the ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country that's not what <laughs> Texas can do for you but what you can do for Texas the guys who come to play for Texas they want to know what I can do to, ha- to to help bring the program back to make sure the program is flourishing the guys who came to play at Texas, they got a different agenda. Hey, what can Texas do for me? You know, where's the where's the where's the opportunities for me? Where's it? Where's my NIL money? Where's the where's the tickets to the shows? I need to know what Texas can do for me. And you can change because we all can. I had guys that when I came to Texas, all right, and I came to play for Texas to bring Texas back, and that was part of the mission. That was the, the mindset for all the guys that came in with me, or at least most of them. There were a lot of guys that came to play at Texas, even back then. But you can shift. We had hell by the time we had, you know, 2001 and 2002. By the time we had that core together, uh, most of the team were here to play for Texas. They understood the assignment. So all it takes is a really positive culture and a constructive culture, and you can convert a lot of those those at Texas guys into for Texas guys. You know, and 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 they did that with Sark came in. When Sark came in in 2021, there were a lot of guys who were here to play at Texas. 
He recognized that, had to shift that entire mindset. So even if he is that guy, if the culture is positive, it'll shift his mindset. You know, you can come in and it'll turn him into one of those guys that's for Texas, not at Texas. Pre, that's a, that's a, that was a good question, though. I appreciate that. Getting back to the defense, though. How do they take the next step to become an elite defense? They're good. Like I said, we had we had a the last time Texas had an elite defense was 2009. Since then, they've only had good defenses a few times. 2011, 14, 17, and 22. So four times since 2009, you've actually just had you've had good defenses. Never a great defense or an elite defense. Uh, someone says players get life changing injuries. So they, so they should be that way. Yeah, no, no. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be getting theirs. No, I'm not saying they shouldn't be getting their money. All right. You got to get yours. You, you definitely can. There is a balance or a blend. I think we can all agree, right? There's a balance and a blend in terms of maximizing opportunities, monetizing opportunities, but still making sure that you are committed to the cost, wholeheartedly committed to the cost. So, you know what I mean? The old thing about the, uh, <laughs> the the chicken and the pig, <laughs> right? Uh, and so I, I I do think there's a balance to it. And these days it's tougher than ever. Back in back in my day, it was a little different because I didn't have nil, didn't have the transfer portal. Now these guys have more opportunities to brand themselves, to monetize their brand, and they they deserve it. Yeah, they should be doing that. That does not, but still, I'm saying that could get you distracted. Don't get distracted from the mission. And the what and the, what the mission is all about, guys like you know Rojo and Bijan are prime examples. You just had two great examples of it. Those are great examples of it. Got got money, cashed in, straight cash homie with the NIL, and still ended up leaving Texas better than they found it. You gotta leave it better than you found it, man. That's part of it's part, it's part of the mission. Leave it better than you found it. So I agree with you about the injuries, though. There needs to be long term health care or longer term health care for guys like that too trust me i'm with you on that texas boy i ain't disagreeing with that um but getting back to it texas how can the defense take the leap right because we haven't it's time for texas to have an elite defense you're getting prospects like this prospects like anthony hill all right prospects like you know colin simmons that will help you become an elite defense all right and getting those guys at different levels that's what they are envisioning when they head to the SEC because that's kind of what these guys are for right now. They're still young bucks, all right? And I think for Texas to take the next leap, you first of all, the, the Havoc plays, that was a hell of a turnaround, all right? That, to me, was – that was phenomenal. For Texas to go from seventh in the Big 12 – actually, they were eighth in the Big 12 in Havoc rate in 2021 – to leading the Big 12 in Havoc rate in 2022 and have no players in the top 33 to having four players in the top 33, that's phenomenal. And a big part of the transformation for Texas on defense last season was, you know, Gary Patterson gets a lot of credit for it. You know, when I tracked the defense in 2021, and I won't spend too much time on it because I know it's depressing, uh, they play a lot of single high defense, just single high deep safety. About 64% of all the explosive plays that they allow, the big chunk yards plays, long runs, 10-plus yards, long passes, 15-plus yards. Um, about 62 to 64% of those plays were allowed when they were in single high. All right, they played a lot of single high coverage. Uh, if you look at overall the passes, about 68% of the passes – uh, that they allowed deep passes they allowed where they were in single high coverage. The reason I bring that up is because when Gary Patterson came on the staff, there was a trans, that was kind of a, a transformational shift, uh, schematic shift with Texas defensively. They played a lot less, all right, single high, and then they went to a lot of two high shell coverage with match court, what they call match quarters, all right, which is basically four deep, but you end up playing – it's a zone man concept, a zone matchup concept, matchup man concept, where the zone deteriorates into a man depending on what the route concept is. So once the route receiver declares their route, where they're going, then you match up, all right, with the receivers. And Texas played a ton of that last year. They, As a matter of fact, they led the Big 12 in that particular coverage concept. 
50, they, they ran quarters coverage around 54% of the time. All right. That, that was more than any team in the big 12. The reason that is interesting is because Gary Patterson, it's, you can see his fingerprints on it. Cause in 2021 TCU ran that same coverage around 54% of the time when he was there, he comes to Texas and he pretty much put his fingerprints on that secondary and on those coverages. And he gave PK the cliff notes to the Big 12. The PK obviously miscalculated the conference when he first came in. He really didn't know the conference. He was playing some of the wrong coverages. He thought it was a passing league. It's a running running league, cross-dressing as a passing league. So he just misidentified some things. GP comes in, gives them the cliff notes, lets us know exactly the, the scouting report on every team since he knows the Big 12 intimately. And then you saw the, 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 the rejuvenated defense. You saw a, a truly uh, a, a, a historic turnaround for the Texas defense. And I think that was a big part of it. Garrett, now, GP's not here, but still, PK's got the cliff notes already. He knows the conference now a little bit better. So I, I wasn't saying that to bring up, oh, man, to panic, Longhorn fans. I was bringing it up to show you the reason, one of the big reasons, for the transformation for Texas. And they're going to get better at that coverage. They're going to play more of it, and they're going to try to play a lot more man coverage too. But then getting back to the Texas defense and how they can make the leap, and that's what we're going to get into next segment, how this defense can make a leap and become an elite defense. Because, I mean, they're good. Like I said, that's – and they they're, they lost some pieces. They lost to Marvion Overshone. They lost uh, Keandre Colburn, more Ojimo. They did. They lost some key pieces. But they also got a lot of talent coming back. And if the continuity with the staff, same system, same terminology, if it ends up paying huge dividends, which it should because we haven't had that in a long time. Usually around this time, they're getting ready to change defensive coordinators for Texas. This is the first time in a long time that third year, PK still here, everybody in the same system. They still know everything. All right, they still know all the they still know what's expected. They know the coaching, ter- they know the terminology of the system, they know uh the checks, audibles, they know the whys of the system as well. So there should be, you know, a a a leap for this defense this season. Like I said, even with you go all the way back to Manny Diaz to Vance Bedford, Todd Orlando, and the Chris Ash thing was was quick too. The, you know, you by the third year. Chris Ash didn't get there, but by the third year, there's a change happening or that defensive coordinator has been already stripped of their duties or in within that third year or something like that. Uh, so this is, is really promising that now you have the comfort for the, all the defensive players that they have, you know, intimate knowledge of the system, which has not really been the case going forward for a while. And the older guys now can, teach the younger guys they can be tutors the coach is the teacher they can be tutors so it was a, the leap in, it was a hell of a leap in the second year i think you can get a, even more of a leap because i i identified like four or five things we'll get into a next segment that texas was uh you know that they they were they were underachievers <laughs> in those particular categories right they were lackluster in those categories because i want to you know talk bad on that defense because that was a that defense that was a hell of a turnaround and that was a that was a good defense last year uh, but how can they become a great defense and elite defense and what is the greatest defense in texas football history i started going down the rabbit hole because i was just looking at defense i was that i was defensive minded i was i was high on the colin simmons commitment <laughs> so i was thinking about defense i i would like to know from you guys what you, in your opinion, what's the greatest defense in Texas football history? Because I got some notes now, and I think I'll give you a list of what I have in my notes. And I, I might surprise you. I might surprise you. All right, so throw them out there to me. I'm gonna see if y'all make my. I got a top ten. I went all the way back. All right, we talking about. I I didn't ignore DKR's great defenses. <laughs> I didn't ignore the defenses from the 70s and the 60s. All right, we gonna get into that. So send them to me, all right? And we'll get into that on the other side. Let's take a break real quick. We'll come back. We'll talk about the Texas defense, how they can become elite, and then we'll discuss the most elite defenses in Texas football history. And uh, does this defense have any chance of even making the top 20? I think not. But that doesn't mean they're not going to be good. We'll take a break. Come right back. This is the broadcast. Let's take a break in three, two, one. 
This Orange Bloods recruiting flashback takes a look back at the single lowest rated recruit of the 2020 recruiting class and one of the five lowest rated position players that the Longhorns have signed in the last five recruiting cycles. That's right, I'm talking about senior All-American linebacker Jalen Ford, a lowly three-star prospect who ranked as the number 127th ranked player in the state of Texas per rivals. Yeesh. <laughs> Ford's recruitment began in earnest in the spring of 2019 when he picked up 16 offers by the end of May, including Power 5 offers from the likes of Kansas, Minnesota, Utah, and Texas Tech. Still, the recruiting services paid him no attention. After taking unofficial visits to Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and Hawaii, Ford took his first official visit to Texas Tech in late May. Quote, this is my only official visit for the summer, Ford said at the time. I'm looking to visit Washington State and Utah early in the season, so maybe I'll be ready around September, then make a decision and announce my commitment shortly after that. True to his word, the trip to Utah proved to be a game changer for Ford as he committed to the Utes on October 8th of his senior season, right after taking his official visit to see the Utes. Very quietly, though, the Longhorns became involved in his recruitment a month later. After Texas assistant coach Tim Beck visited Ford at his high school, Tom Herman called him a week later to offer a scholarship. Ford did a good job of keeping the news of Texas's interest under wraps. In fact, in early December, Ford told Orange Bloods that he hadn't even been talking to the Texas staff. At the time, Lone Star was alive in the Texas State playoffs, and Ford said he wanted to remain focused on his team's playoff run. Once Lone Star season came to an end on December 14th, Ford began to focus on his upcoming decision, and he finalized the decision to commit to Texas a week later. It was really right before I was going to sign, Ford said. At that point, football is over. I finally had some time to sit down and think. The day I didn't sign, the first day of signing day, I had to call Utah and Texas. It was a little bit chaotic. On December 23rd of 2019, Ford committed to the Longhorns, and the rest is Texas football history. All right, welcome back to the Rodcast, and uh, that was a perfect, <laughs> that was a perfect little snippet. We were just talking about Jalen Ford and the defense, and yes, I see the uh, texter. I saw that on the chat. Blake says, "I feel like the defense took a, a leap in year two. They took a hell of a leap. They went from allowing thirty-one points per game in twenty twenty-one to twenty-one in twenty twenty-two, two hundred rushing yards per game in twenty twenty-one to one hundred twenty-three in twenty twenty-two, and five point two yards per carry, which was." second most in program history in 2021 and he allowed 3.3 yards per carry in 2022 hell of a leap i want another one Are we talking about championship caliber defenses i want another one my man cb makes a great point too if pk makes it to 2024 which he 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 better make it to 2024 because if not everything i'm talking about is moot <laughs> um if he does he'll be the longest tenured dc since bull reese call bull reese my dc yeah Exactly. That's how much turnover there's been. So the, 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 for me, the theory, the hypothesis all right, of why the defense can take another leap is stability and continuity with the coaching staff and within the same system. Trust me, playing in the same system with Carl Burris, we got better pretty much every year. You could argue 01, though. It, it, 01 and 02, I guess there was regression, but 01, we were so damn good. <laughs> and 01, that defense was... I mean, it was such an elite defense. I mean, we were number one in total defense that year. We were number three in scoring. We were top, we were top six in rush defense, number three pass defense. I mean, we were legit. so there really was nowhere to go. So there was a regression in 02, but there was nowhere to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you guys keep sending some great uh some great suggestions for great best defenses all time for Texas. 05, Chris says 05 is 68 and 04. Uh, CB says the best one he watched with his own eyes is 01. Thank you, CB. I appreciate that. It was a damn good one. It was a damn good one. Uh, William says 1983 gave up 20, uh, gave up plus 20 once, I, and I think, and lost the national championship on a muff punt. Uh, yeah, no, that, that was good. One. That was on my list. I got a list here. All right. I got a list here. All right, so we're gonna get we're gonna get to it. All right, I'll get to that list here in a second. First, we'll talk about the Texas defense. Y'all keep all the suggestions coming. And yes, Sark after dark, South Dallas takeover. 
I get <laughs> it is a South Dallas takeover, no doubt. I gave y'all that stat yesterday. I guess I can review it since we do a South Dallas takeover. Uh, that the DFW area and and, and Sark knows this too because Sark, you know, he's been doing a great job of recruiting that DFW area. If you look at drafted players since 2020, the DFW area would have more players drafted than any other state except for Texas, Florida, Georgia, and California since 2020. That's how many players have been drafted from that area. It's booming. And I'm an H-Town guy. I don't like to give Dallas that much credit, but that is – they they doing something. They, 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 it, when you're talking about football championships, high school wise, you're talking about just next level, pr, you know, prospects and NFL talent. DFW is where it's at. I, I, I would put it up against any Metroplex, any area in the country in producing NFL talent right now. No doubt. It can support several big time programs <laughs> by itself. All right. Let's get back to the defense. All right. Uh, because I, this defense was a good defense last year. Here's how they become a great defense. There are a couple of things they got to clean up. First of all, money downs. Y'all remember it? Money downs, money downs, money downs. All right. I watched the Johnny Manziel documentary, and he always has his the money symbol, whatever he would score. Texas got a – maybe they should come up with their own money symbol for the money downs, third and fourth down or the money downs. And Texas, uh, in, in the Big 12, just in the conference, they were eighth. And third down defense, um, they were seventh and fourth down defense. Yeah. So that's something they got to figure out. Uh, yeah, no no reports on the injuries yet. Keep checking. I guarantee you, you'll get, so you'll get updated on it. But that's, to me, where this defense can take a huge leap. Is there third down and fourth down defense? Money downs. And Sark has talked about it. That's situational awareness. Right, that's just as, as guys being more aware of the situation, the down, the distance, and that Sark has talked about how this is a higher IQ football team, and those those money downs, it is about knowing the down, knowing the distance, you know, knowing your situation. I always say that you're trying to cultivate football investigators on defense, legit football investigators who can they can you know, look at and extract clues and hints from different things on the field, whether it be the down and the distance, the alignment of the receivers, the formation, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the film study that you've watched uh, matching up with what you're seeing, their tendencies, their patterns, things that they like to do and how they've been attacking you all game long. And if you pick up on enough of these clues as a football investigator, you will narrow down the amount, or at least narrow down the ways that the offense is going to try to exploit and attack you. And once you narrow down those, those options and narrow down all the different ways that they can attack you down to three or four maybe possible ways, it'll give you a jump on. You're not, as a DB, you, you, you should never, I was told you should never be defending every route on the route tree. If you're doing that, that's a fool's errand, and you're going to lose. You don't lose doing that, all right? What you have to do is, uh, you know, use your in, your football intellect and acumen to narrow down the ways an offense is going to attack you. And you can do it, like I said, you do it with formation. You can do it based on the personnel package they're using. The down and the distance gives you a lot of hints because some teams, when it's third and six, most teams are going to run – a play that is going to get them a first down and get them to the first down. And that's why a lot of defenses, they flat foot read the third downs and they, they sit on the routes right at the sticks. Cause they know offense are trying to get to the sticks. Very rarely offense is going to try to go deep on a third and medium. They're going to try to get the medium because it's a higher percentage chance and convert. So you, you, you know, these tendencies, you know, these habits and as a defender, you know, as a football investigator, you narrow down the ways they're going to attack you based on all these clues. You don't have long. It's pretty much your pre-snap read. That's what it is. And if you can teach all your defenders to think this way, which is how most of my teammates were around 0102, 
They were all, we were all football investigators. We all picked up our own clues and we shared clues with each other and communicated. Your, your defense will be steps ahead of the offense. So to me, that's, that's where you're trying to get. That's where you're trying to get all your guys. Jalen Ford is there. Jade Barron is there. There's some guys, they're, they're already there. J- Jerry Thompson is probably there already as an elder statesman. Some guys are already in that category, but that's what that's, I think that's what help you on money downs. Just knowing the situation, football acumen, football intellect, film study. Also the past defense, I think is going to improve, but last year that was the only way to attack Texas. You couldn't run on Texas. They only allowed 3.3 yards per carry. You couldn't run the rock consistently against Texas. You may break one every now and then like Bama did, like TCU did, but you can just pound the rock. You can just pound the rock. So that's why the, the secondary this year, they did, there's a lot of attention on them. I think they're going to be up to the task. But if they underperform this season uh, and they allow a lot of pass yards like they did last year, which they, you know, and like I said, they were still a good defense, but that was the only way to attack Texas. So Texas, schematically, philosophically, they they wanted teams to try to throw on them, and they would obviously pressure the quarterback, which they did really well, top 10 in pressures. So the plan worked, stuff the run, force them to throw, then a predictable passing situation, and then let our pressure, uh, you know, discombobulate the quarterback and then hopefully get home. The problem was they didn't get home enough. They had... They were top 10 in pressures, so they had the pressure, but they only had 27 sacks. So they were second, I believe, of the top 10 teams in pressures. They were second to last in sacks. So they still got – there's still room for improvement. As as PK said, they missed 13 sacks. That's a big number. You get half of those. You get a third more of those. Who knows? That may be another win. He said they missed 20 – what, 21 opportunities? to make a play to get another takeaway, that's a big number. So that also is where I think they can improve. And the pass defense, if they're going to improve on it, they got to look at um, stopping inside cuts. I've talked about this. I'm going to keep talking about it. Last year, they got eaten alive by inside cuts. So they're going to play man, and they're going to play that match quarters. Man, you get inside leverage. Get inside. Get inside. They got killed on slants. Slants last year, teams completed damn near 66% of their slants and converted 43% of them into first downs or touchdowns. They Texas, they ate on the slant last year against Texas. A lot of teams did. Post routes, completion percentage was lower, but they still got a really high first down and touchdown rate. You're at 40, you're at 44%. You're at 44% on the post route, glance route, which is a skinny post. Come on, 75% completion percentage, hitting the glance routes. Um, you know, if you look at angle routes, you know, teams were really successful completing the angle routes, over 70%. In routes, just a basic in route, just a three, four yards and breaking in at a 90 degree. Teams uh, converted 53% of those, over 53% of those into first downs. They got to stop the inside cuts. And I think a lot of that is they'll they'll be better in the, you know up the central nervous system of the defense, the communication center right there. That is that was one of the only vulnerabilities of the defense. You can kind of hit them with those in cuts, and, and so they have to figure out a way to have their DBs playing more inside leverage to take away the inside easy completion, the high percentage completion for the quarterback. Too many of those last season. Y'all remember it versus Oklahoma State? Too many of them. All right, they were easy. And then at times, uh, t- you know, teams would end up being able to break some of those too. So that's that's room for improvement. You got to learn how to uh, play the bunch formations a little bit better. That's you know the, the the condensed bunch sets. They weren't real great at that last year. Being able to read and react to a route combination or a route, uh, you know, a switch release. Um, and they didn't do that really well last year. That's something the DBs are going to get better at as they play with each other and they know they learn the communication uh, about whose responsibility and who's going to take the inside cut, who takes the outside cut. Also, like I said, empty formation. They were a little vulnerable to empty formation, but I, honestly, I think everybody is. I think everybody is. All right. I think every, everybody's ready for that. 
Um, okay, so I want to get to the conversation about the all-time greatest defense and get back to it. And that's what we'll get into uh, next segment. I'm going to get to the all-time greatest defense in Texas football history. I did some research. All right. Hey, what's up, T-Live? H-Town, baby. Appreciate that. Lamar representing in the house. Hey, we got a lot of uh, Houston Lamar people hanging out, man. I appreciate that. All right. Old school, baby. All right. So we'll get into it. I want to talk about the greatest defense in Texas football history. Or greatest. This is obviously up for debate. All right. So nothing's definitive. But I did some research. And I'll share my research with you. Uh, the conversation was about could this defense end up in that conversation? Uh, this is some rarefied air. So we'll talk about that on the other side. All-time greatest Texas defenses. Um, hit me up on the chat. Let me know what defenses that you would put in that category. We'll come back. We'll address it. We'll discuss it. Last segment on the broadcast. Uh, we'll come back uh, and get into some of uh, the, uh, the chat conversation as well. All of that and more. We come back right here on the broadcast. Three, two. This Orange Bloods recruiting flashback takes a look at a player that was the first commitment of the TCU class of 2020 and became the last signee of the Texas 2020 recruiting class with a little stopover in Waco in between. That's right, Texas senior defensive back Jade Barron had one hell of a recruitment before eventually developing into one of the most important remaining players from a somewhat disastrous 2020 recruiting class. For those that might not remember, Barron finished as a mid three-star prospect in the Rivals.com rankings while finishing 79th in the state and 72nd in the country as a cornerback. Should note for the record that I had Barron ranked as a four-star prospect in my rankings and the number 30 overall prospect in the state. When we look at his recruitment, things really started to heat up following a junior day visit in February of 2019 to TCU and Gary Patterson. After visiting on the junior day in February, Barron committed just a couple of weeks later, citing that Patterson's track record of developing players was a big reason for his decision. Yet a little more than a month later, Barron backed out of his commitment to Patterson, primarily because his offer list started to take off shortly after his commitment, with the likes of Oklahoma State, Tennessee, and Arizona jumping into the mix. Before his decommitment, he actually took an unofficial visit to the 40 Acres, although the Longhorns didn't offer. Fast forward to June 22nd, and Barron announced his commitment to Baylor. From that moment on, all the way through the rest of signing day, Barron was solid as a rock to the Bears, even in the aftermath of the departure of Baylor head coach Matt Rule. Things changed for Barron in April as he asked for Baylor to release him from his national letter of intent. Quote, Thank you to the Baylor Nation for embracing me, he said on Twitter. Today, I requested an official release from my NLI to Baylor and will begin looking for a new school to pursue my athletic dreams and career goals. Eight days later, Barron committed to Tom Herman's Texas Longhorns. Flipping Barron was a huge win for defensive backs coach Jay Valai, who had only been in Austin for a few months when he landed Barron. Barron was the 20th and final signee to a 2020 recruiting class that finished 16th in the nation. While Bijan Robinson is famously remembered as the headliner of the class, Barron was one of the three lowest rated prospects in the entire group, according to Rivals.com. Of the two players ranked lower than Barron, one of them was none other than All-America linebacker Jalen Ford. Hey, what's up? Welcome back. And a lot, a lot of the uh, snippets are from on the defensive side of the ball today. I, I don't know if it's my conversation or if it's the Colin Simmons mojo, uh, but everybody's talking defense. We appreciate you guys. Uh, also, yes, my man Blake behind the scenes working for us. <laughs> uh, but appreciate you guys on the chat. Uh, Chuck, appreciate you for sure. Uh, appreciate the love. And also, man, this is H-Town shout outs. Uh, H-Town, Westbury, Houston Westbury getting a shout out here too. Uh, and uh, shout out to Raymond too, man. I'm glad the uh, the broadcast is back. Glad to join y'all all season long. Uh, we're going to be talking football and we ain't going to have enough time. I guarantee you that to talk all the football we're going to get into. All right. So Jim says 1983 defense. That's his defense. Oh, I love Texas boy it says Catalan will have wide receivers afraid to catch the ball. So we good about those inside cuts. I hope so. But listen, Jalen Catalan is, is fragile. I don't know if suddenly want him in the box down there all the time. I heard Sark say they, they plan him and he's a full go, no restrictions, uh, no restrictions. 
but I want him playing in center field. I want him to be our version of, of Earl Thomas. I want him in center field and being able to, you know, use his range and then he can be in coverage a lot more than having him stuff the run in the box and run the alley. He can do it. He can do it, but he's like Rod B. I could do it. I, I can listen, I can bust up a wedge, but the ramifications and consequences of me busting up that wedge of 600 pounds of human coming at me, 180 pounds of human and me blowing it up like I did in the NFL will be the three shoulder surgeries that I had in the NFL. So I could do it, but there are consequences. <laughs> so like I said, I, I know and Jalen Catalan ain't got no fear in him. So you're right. He going to bring the, he going to bring the hammer, but there are consequences to that hammer and we want him playing the entire season. So I, if I'm the coaches, I probably would have him in the rotation of my safeties. He'd be more in coverage. I just would do it like that. I know the coaches, they're not going to say that. I would do that. I want him to play. The guy's an he's an NFL safety. Uh, he's an NFL safety. All right, so Jim says 1983 defense, which – and we can debate this. I think your top – I would just say the top five is going to end up being some – uh, you probably going to end up with some amalgamation, a grouping of 83, 79, 2005. Uh, some of y'all forget it. Oh, one, because I, I, I'm not just patting myself on the back. Oh, one was a damn good defense. And don't forget about 69. 69 was, I mean, that, that was a good, that was a great defense, actually, 69. I think allowed what a little over 10 points per game. That if you want to look at all of them, this, this is why I consider all the greatest. Now, then I'll probably give you a ranking. Oh, because 01 and 69 are in there. I said 05, 83, 79, 2009, 77, the 77 defense, 61, 2000, 2008, 2004. I don't know if I missed any elite defense in Texas football history. I think that's, that's, all, I believe that's all like the elite defenses. Yeah. 83, 83 is hard. 83 is at the, I'm, I'm my, really my list. I couldn't decide between 83, 1979 and then 2005. The reason, because 2005 for me was the best defense that I watched as a, I'm, I'm with my man CB that I got a chance to see that I'm like, whoa, you know what I mean? And, and know the talent level and all that. I'm, I was born in 1980, so I can't say I saw 79. I can't say I really know 83. I asked my dad about it. My dad told me about the, the 83 defenses and DBU. Uh, and, you know, so, yeah, Charles, I feel you. 83 was the best Texas defense. He said, I was, so I, I'm with you. It's, uh, it's really the, your eye test is part of this, too. And that's why I threw 2005 up there because that's my eye test. But 83 and 79, it seems like 83 is going to get the number one spot. Most I've seen even on the chat, most people, if you bring this discussion to a Longhorn fan, 83 comes up more than 79. Well, 83, 83 ended up uh, allowing what less than 10 points per game, around nine points per game total. At 83 defense was stat went 11 and one, won the Southwest Conference. Um, man, they <laughs> like I said, allowed only like nine and a half points per game, finished. Number five, that was a, yeah, that was a league defense. The 2005 defense, I'm, I'm with my man CB. It had elements, especially the secondary, greatest secondary in the history of Texas, of Texas football. So you put that out there. <laughs> and I don't know if any other defense had more drafted players. I had to go look. 83 probably had a lot of guys drafted too. You had a lot of rounds back then. Uh, and that defense was loaded. Uh, but 83 and 79, 79, as I pointed out, Allowed eight, uh, less than nine points per game. That's why you got to throw that one in there. And they had three losses, and those three losses were four, 17, 14, 13, 7, and 14, 7. <laughs> it, wasn't all, it wasn't the defense fault. So, honestly, I'll throw it out there. I'll go 79 or 83 and 05. It's probably, some, it's probably a debate between those three, and 83 is probably going to get most of the love, uh, but like I said, 05, I set eyes on that one. But I have basically 83, 79, 2005, then 1969, 2001. So, yeah, my defense made the top five. 
1961, 77, 2000, 2008, that makes 10. And I picked 2008 over 2004. I know. I picked I picked the way over 04. 04 deserves a, a probably more of a case to be in that top 10, but that 08 defense was yeah, that, that defense was loaded too. And if you know hell the DVs it, that they don't allow Crabtree <laughs> to catch the game winning touchdown, winning double coverage, by the way, and they couldn't push him out. Yeah, that that would probably change the the perception of the OA defense entirely. And they probably would be considered one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. And 83 should have won the national title. My man CB says, just like 2008. Now I know that crap double covered by two NFL DBs. I mean, that was a perfect call guys. We can't get mad at much. That was a beautiful call. He knew they was going to crab tree, double covered crab tree and figured they'll at least throw it. They'll at least push him out of bounds. Oh, yeah, that would hurt. Trust me. I got one like that in Lubbock, too. It's Lubbock. Yeah, I got one like that. Oh, two. So I can't, honestly, I'm in no position to judge. <laughs> I'm in no position to judge. I'm in no position to judge. I had one like that in 02. We could have went to a we could have went to a BCS game in 02. It was uh pretty much guaranteed. It guaranteed if we had won that game and playing Cliff Kingsbury. I just watched him on the Johnny Manziel documentary. Cliff freaking Kingsbury and Wes Welker. Cliff Kingsbury and Wes Welker. That's who basically won the game for him. Still to this day, I'm not going to lie, that that one still, it bites, man. That one still hurts a little bit. And that, that because we were so much better than Tech. And Tech wasn't a scrub or anything. I mean, that's Mike Leach, great system. I mean, those guys were, were, were awesome. Um, it turned, I'm glad that Wes Welker ended up being a great player because then I don't feel as bad about him lighting this up the way he did in that game. I, I got to go look at his stat line. <laughs> uh, but we had a lot of injuries in that game, too. I'm not making excuses. I'm not making excuses. We had a ton of injuries in that game. We lost, like, I want to say we lost probably four starters on, on defense. I got to go find it. But we had a lot of guys go down, including my man, Nasty Nate. I believe Nasty Nate went down that game, too. Um, and once that happened, man, that it, it seemed like it became just a – straight up shootout and just the offense did their part defense didn't do our part yeah shout out to mike leach man now you can't <laughs> hey, hey he beat us he got the best of us on that day and i'll i'll say this too about it um i i put a lot of the the blame on myself probably me making it about me and not about the team but when we had the injuries in that game and west walker was eating us up I, I had if I I had enough clout. I was a senior. I had enough clout. I could have went to Coach Akina, and me and Coach Akina were close enough. And I could have said, "Hey, put me on Welker." We played a lot of man anyway. I could have been in the slot. I could just say, "Hey, put me on Welker. Put me at the nickel, and put me on Welker." Because he was in the slot, and he was just you know it. It was just pretty. It seemed like he was option routes. He was either quick out or a quick. It was a quick slant or a quick out. And man, he just just ate us alive. And probably should have went. And told Coach Akina, hey, coach, listen, it's my secondary, which it was. I was a leader back then. I should say, you know what, coach? Put me on. If we, if, if he if he does me dirty and eats me up, then it's all right. At least we made an adjustment. We put our best foot forward. We had the best plan of attack that we could throw out there. But I didn't do it. Still to this, that's one of my big regrets. I ain't gonna lie to y'all. I'm 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 a, I'm a, I'm a confess. One of my big regret. I should have did it. I remember Jade Barron did it last year. When they had injuries in the secondary, he went to the coach and said, put me at the corner spot. You're, you're a dog. You got to do that. Yeah. Thank you, CB. Cliff Kingsbury, 473 yards and six touchdowns. Oh, and listen, I just found the article. How about this? This is the, the injuries that we had that day. All right. Because we had a ton of injuries that came down. We, okay, here it is. Um, back in Lubbock in 2002, by early in the game, starters Derek Johnson, Marcus Tubbs, Nathan Basher, and Kalen Thornton were all out with injuries. Freaky stuff going on in Lubbock at night. We lost Derek Johnson. We lost Nathan Vasher, Marcus Tubbs, and Kalen Thornton. So we lost two first-round draft picks. We lost the all-time leader in interceptions in the history of DBU. And we lost Kalen Thornton. 
who was a great defensive end for us. And I want to say used to, and now I'm going to get these mixed up, went from CB, let me know if I'm wrong, went from Nike to Gatorade or Gatorade to Nike. Back and forth, like he was like an executive for him. He's really smart, guys. Yeah, <laughs> he's one of those. But my point is, we lost four starters in that game, early in the game. And nasty Nate went down. And nasty Nate, you know, at times he would, you know, be able to, to shift and then go inside and go in the slot. We had a lot of DBs and the young DBs. And I'm not, I'm not saying I would have done better because our young DBs were Michael Huff. And, <laughs> and like Cedric Griffin. So the young DBs can hold their own. I ain't talking trash on them. But, man, I think I would have been able, as my, my savvy veteran experience in film study, I believe I would have been able to take away some of the, the easy option routes in the quick game for Wes Welker. And if we, had to, if we, if we could have made Cliff Kingsbury keep the ball a little bit longer, I think we would have been better off. But then he was just getting rid of the ball in timing, on time, on schedule. It's a damn shame. He really was. So there you go. Confession from Rob B. Y'all, y'all know one, my, one of my big regrets. And then if we win that game, we, we go to the BCS. Come on now. Uh, Abel says, not elite, but that 2017 defense was really good and uh, won a lot of games with that D-plus <laughs> D plus punter combo. No, uh, the thing about that, um, that 2017 defense was 30th. So it was a good defense. They were 30th in, in scoring defense that year. And remember, that's when Todd Orlando uses the lightning package, six DBs, that lightning package. Uh, and he has Gary Johnson and Malik Jefferson are his two linebackers who end up being faster than most any of the DBs in that group. And that ended up being a, a really good defense. You've, only, you, you've had a good defense or a really good defense four times since 2009, which was the last time you had an elite defense, which is, in my opinion, a top 15, top 20 defense. You haven't had that in a while. Can this defense crack the top 20? They were 28th last year. Can they crack the top 20? That is kind of the question that we're getting at. And would they be in this conversation that we're talking about with the greatest defenses in Texas football history? 83's got it. I'll give it to 83. We'll go 83, then 79, then, uh, then uh, 2005. Out of the out of that group, even though I'm going to still put 01 as, <laughs> as one of the top five best defenses in Texas football history. But we won't elite defense. It's been a minute. That's one thing where I think also that Texas is trending toward. That's another uh, box that Sark has got to check. Can they have elite defense? And the question is, without GP, because Gary Patterson's still not here, without GP, all right. Uh, oh, my man. Yeah. CB says Google says Thornton is a Gatorade exec. Yeah. He, no, he, he used to work, I believe, with Nike and then went to Gatorade to work, you know, for their like executive level, too. Oh, no. He's one of them. I see him every now and then. And that, usually when I see him, he's in a ballerific spot that I don't expect to see him because I'm, 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 a, I'm not expecting to be in this ballerific spot either. I get invited by somebody who's somebody. <laughs> and then I see him up in there kicking it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think this Texas defense getting guys like Colin Simmons, that's for the future, but will it take, you know, Colin Simmons and Anthony Hill and that group being mainline starters before you have an elite defense again, I would, it, it would be nice if Texas could get in that rarefied air before they go to the SEC. So there you go. Um, all right. Uh, there you go. I, we only had an hour today. Just talking a little defense. We'll come back tomorrow. All right. We'll get into some uh, some Texas football discussion tomorrow. Probably want to bring on a guest to talk about Colin Simmons. I know y'all y'all got that one more of that Colin Simmons love. So we go give it to you. So we'll try to we we we'll try to see if we can get in contact with one of the uh, the the all star recruiting analysts from the Orange Bloods Network, and we'll do that too tomorrow. And we'll talk, of course, NFL. We got preseason tonight. So we're going to talk a little bit about the NFL. we got some preseason game. The Texans are in action versus the Patriots. So we'll talk about C.J. Stroud a little bit. I did watch the Johnny Manziel documentary just real quick before we get out of here. Uh, I did watch it. It's not a thorough investigative piece or anything if you haven't watched it. It's just reliving the Johnny Manziel phenomenon with behind-the-scenes footage, with interviews with the main characters. That's about all it is. Uh, I, I thought it was entertaining, though. I thought it was entertaining and good. But uh, it, it's basically all the things we assumed about Johnny, but now we get it confirmed. <laughs> That's all it is. But it does show you how much money uh, a player like Johnny football, and 
Yeah, he he even brings up Vince Young as being one of his inspirations. A player like Vince Young. CB says it was just okay. Yeah, they they there was a lot they they could have got deeper. They didn't get as deep as they could. They could have got real deep, and they didn't. The deepest thing was that Johnny, spoiler alert, oh man, listen, that Johnny has had some some issues with you know mental health. I won't spoil too much, but and that he you know he needs to take better care of himself. Period. Like that's just serious. Aside from all the jokes and everything about that, but it was what was phenomenal was that you know all the money that everybody made off of this one guy having a a a extraordinary you know, historical season and everybody benefited, you know, Cliff Kingsbury even brings it up. Like, Hey man, we were, we were all getting raises. We we're all getting, you know, uh, you know, promotions as a result of Johnny football and truly the same thing happened at Texas with VY. I mean, if VY got here too, but everybody, you know, got bumps, promotions off of that. There is a, a butterfly effect to that. That is really something you can't even quantify. You can try, but you go and you be end up close to billion a billion dollars in terms of the overall economic impact of players like that, and that's where Texas is now. They're trying to they're hoping Quinn Ewers can be that kind of player. You're hoping that you know Arch Manning can be that kind of player. The beauty for Texas was they stacked two back to back. They stacked a Vince Young and a Colt McCoy. That is tough to do, and it's almost impossible to go three all time great Hall of Fame caliber any things in a row, albums, coaches, quarterbacks, Texas shows you that. Look at the quarterback situation. You go VY, you go Colt, and it's like, nah, you can't get three in a row. (laughs) And, I mean, look at the Pittsburgh Steelers are the only example of of a team that's done it three Hall of Famers in a row, three all-time greats in a row. Because Tomlin will be a Hall of Famer. You had, you know, Bill Cowher and you had Chuck Noll. Yep, Packers with Favre and Rod. Exactly. We'll see. Join Love. All right. We'll see what Join Love is made. Of. Can Join Love be the third all-time great quarterback in a row? Look at Oklahoma football. Look at Brett Venables. Can he be the third all-time great iconic, you know, <laughs> head coach in Oklahoma consecutive head coach in Oklahoma football? Mm, that's tough to ask. That's a tough ask, man. That's so it's hard to do. Three all-time great albums. How many artists have been able to come up with three iconic all-time great albums in a row? I'm sure it's happened, but that's the exception to the rule. And so for Texas, they experienced that. But now, hopefully, it's time for one of those transcendent figures in Texas football. Uh, so I bet you can name three jamming screw tapes in a row. <laughs> that I can. That I can. That is true. And I think that's a great way to leave it. All right. Hey, thank you guys for participating, man. The broadcast is so much fun. So come back tomorrow, man. We're going to have even more fun tomorrow because we're talking more football. The closer we get to football season, uh, the more football we're going to dive deeper into. Uh, so tomorrow we'll talk Texas football. Also talk Texans because they're in action tonight. As a matter of fact, Oh, I got to go set the DVR to record them Texas. All right, so come back tomorrow, folks. Same time, same channel. Appreciate all the participation. Remember, the revolution will not be televised. We'll be talking about it right here on the broadcast. Hook them.